From whom do we receive the power to evangelize? Well, not surprising to anyone here, I'm sure. The answer is the Holy Spirit. But let's be clear about who the Holy Spirit is, because to really understand what he does in evangelization, we need to ground ourselves once again in who he is. Because, of course, what he does flows from who he is. The Holy Spirit, to begin with, the church tells us, is the crossfire, the bond of love between the Father and the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. So the Spirit, we need to know, is not an impersonal force, i.e. Star Wars, you know, the force out there somewhere, but he is a divine person. He is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. It's important to state that as well, because in our time, of course, many of the post-Christian sects which exist do not see the Holy Spirit as a person, but as some kind of force that's out there, you know, uh, something out of Star Wars, as I say. So he is a person. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to us. Our Lord sends him as another advocate. Of course, Jesus himself is advocate of the Father, right? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And he will guide you into all truth. Advocate from the, from the Greek basically means someone who stands at the side of another. So someone who is sent to stand beside you, almost, almost like, uh, like a, you know, legal terms, like a lawyer. Someone who is going to defend you. Someone who is going to encourage you. Someone who is going to bear witness on your behalf. So that we are not alone. Jesus sends to us the Holy Spirit, who is another advocate who stands with us. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we shared earlier this morning, have a joint mission. I'm going to read that um, section of the Catechism again, because <clears throat> you'll see how it will apply here very much so. When the Father sends his word, he always sends his breath. In their joint mission, the Son and Holy Spirit are distinct but inseparable. To be sure, it is Christ who is seen, the visible image of the invisible God, but it is the Spirit who reveals him. They are distinct but inseparable. It really is a huge mistake, as we're going to see as this talk unfolds, to think that we can evangelize only with the Son and not with the Holy Spirit and not in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. You're with me. This is preaching to the choir here, I think, a little bit. The Holy Spirit is the life giver, as we heard in the Creed, in the Nicene Creed. He's the life giver. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while Ruah, or the Spirit, a mighty wind, the wind of God, swept over the waters. That Hebrew Ruach, as I'm told it's pronounced Ruach, uh, or... <clears throat> In the Greek, pneuma means air in motion, spirit, breath, wind, which flows. He's the wind of God, and he always comes with the word. In the creation of man, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So not just on the natural level, but also on the supernatural level, the Holy Spirit is the life giver. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. John 6, 63, our Lord's words. So that's just a bit of a quick preview and review of who the Holy Spirit is. Now we want to look at his role in evangelization. So right from the beginning, we see that it's absolutely crucial. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent of evangelization. From Pope Paul VI, it must be said that the Holy Spirit is the principal agent of evangelization. It is he who impels each individual to proclaim the gospel. It is he who in the depths of conscience causes the word of salvation to be accepted and understood. He's the principal agent from the very beginning to the very end. Both in that cycle of evangelization 
And as we saw in the progression of evangelization, the Holy Spirit is at work constantly. So evangelization really needs to be led by, or, or, by the Spirit. If the Spirit is the principal agent, it is not ultimately just something I do. It's something I do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit's lead. Evangelization is best when the Holy Spirit is very active and obviously active in the midst of evangelization. I want to use just a little example of evangelization which is led by the Holy Spirit. Um, this, this happened to me about four, coming up on five years ago. I was living in the, uh, in the South Bronx <clears throat> with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And some of the friars and myself had been praying for what we called divine encounters. Lord, we want to speak to people about you. We want to be able to share the message. So you set things up for us. You send your Holy Spirit to just make things happen the way they're supposed to. Let people run across our track. Give us opportunities to share, and we will. We will. But we're asking you to set it up. We're asking you, Holy Spirit, to come and, and make the whole thing happen and possible. Well, it's a very uh, structured life living with them. And the only time you really had free was about four hours on the Sunday afternoon. And I used to like to go down to uh, the tip of Manhattan Island and take the Staten Island Ferry just to get some wind in the hair and kind of, all right, I'm not in the middle of the city in the streets anymore, you know. Uh, I'm a British Columbia boy, and so living in the middle of the South Bronx is a little constricting after a while. So myself and two of the friars got onto the subway, and I immediately noticed a young lady. She was probably about 26 or so, and I'm guessing that at one time in her life, she was probably very, very attractive. But it was also very obvious she had been living on the streets and was probably very sick. Hair was matted and oiled and tangled. Uh, her clothes were in disarray. She had dark, dark rings around her eyes and b red blotches on her face. She was not in good shape at all. And immediately, my attention was drawn to her. I just, for some reason, just, it struck me. And I noted that she took notice of us as well. Well, so we're riding in this subway car. Now, if you know anything about the subway cars in New York, you know that it is a cardinal sin to speak. No one says a word to anyone else. It's just this code of silence, you know. If anyone says anything, everybody begins looking in horror and terror at them. But after a time, she got up out of her seat and came over to us. And I was wearing my collar, of course. And she said, are you, are you a priest? Are you really a priest? I said, yes, I'm a Catholic priest. And a cry came from the depths of her soul. Help me! Help me! And she began to tear up, and then she just began to speak out all the things that she was into in her life. And I said, wait, 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 wait one minute. And we, the subway stopped, and we all got out. It was in the middle of Harlem. I took her over to a bench, thousands of people walking in all sorts of directions, and there had the opportunity to share with her about Jesus, to share with her about the lover of her soul who died for her, who gave his life for her, so she could have a life full of hope and not, a, you know, not be lost. And I, I shared the gospel with her to the best of my ability. Turned out she had been baptized Catholic. I was able to hear her confession, uh, reconcile her to the Lord. It was, I mean, it was a powerful moment. At the end, we were wearing these wooden crosses. I put the cross over her neck and one of the friars was there, got on the phone and set up a place for her at Mother Teresa's Mission House for Women. So, I mean, it was just an amazing encounter. Amazing encounter. And it was led by the Holy Spirit from beginning to end. From beginning to end. The Holy Spirit had prepared her heart. We'd asked for divine encounters. He led us to this person. She was, a, you know, something was happening inside of her. The spirit was at work before we even got there. She came over. We were able to speak to it. It was a powerful instance of the Holy Spirit being the principal agent. He really started the whole thing and brought it to conclusion. It was a beautiful, beautiful event. We're told, um, this is a quote from Salvador Martinez, who's the renewal in the spirit. It's the uh, Italian charismatic renewal group. This is a little quote from him. Without the Spirit, 
Evangelization is like a stagnant river. Charity, like fire without heat. The Word, something indeclinable. The Eucharist, an impenetrable mystery. The other will never be a neighbor. Um, the world a hell, paradise of forgotten reality. The church a mother without love. Without the Holy Spirit, our evangelization will not have force. It will not have zest. It will not have the power that it should have. When we try and evangelize on our own in ways that are not spirit-led, we know what happens. I'll use another example from my own life. When I first sort of was awakened to the truth, the reality, the love, and the power of God, when I experienced the Holy Spirit in a very personal way, about the first thing that I wanted to do was go and tell my family. Uh, the founder of our community, Father Bob, says, you know, when people really get struck powerfully by the Holy Spirit, we should probably lock them up for about six months and not let them talk to anybody. Well, I was one of those people. Because I went into my family and I started to, you know, kind of, well, all I did was alienate them. You know, I just, I was condemning and I was hard and I was, you know, ready to tap the dust off my feet because I didn't understand. You know, it was just terrible. And it was all human. It wasn't time. It wasn't their time at that point. You know, the, in, they call it the Kairos moment. God has an appointed time for everyone. And I was trying to force something. Push and force by my own human effort, my own human ideas. And of course, all I did was set back the work of evangelization quite a bit. It's taken a long time to undo that and it's still not there. So I pray God will have mercy on my family due to my ignorance more than anything else and my stupidity. But can you see the, the difference between those two events? How radically different they are? The difference between spirit-led evangelization and evangelization that we're trying to do on human means alone that is not spirit-led? Amen? All right. So I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit in the various cycle of evangelization that we saw earlier on. The Holy Spirit is active in every one of those stages that we talked about. He is the principal agent at every step of the journey. So our first step that we talked about this morning was witness. We need to know that it is the Holy Spirit who transforms us into effective witnesses of the gospel. All of us gazing with unveiled Faces on the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same likeness from one degree of glory to another as from the Lord who is the Spirit, from St. Paul in 2 Corinthians. Pope Paul VI, he alone, the Holy Spirit, he alone stirs up the new creation, the new humanity of which evangelization is to be the result. He gives us holy lives. He penetrates the darkness of our lives. He is the one who transforms us so that our witness will be convincing. Amen? Amen? Proclamation. The Holy Spirit is the one who places the words on the lips of evangelizers. It is he who explains to the faithful the deep meaning of the teaching of Jesus and of his mystery. The Holy Spirit places on his lips the words which he could not find by himself. How many times have you been in a discussion or evangelizing and suddenly you're saying something that you're thinking in your head, whoa, that's pretty good. I never thought of that. And then, you know, as soon as you're done, you, you go down and you write it down so you don't forget it. The Holy Spirit, how many people can say they've had some kind of experience? See that? The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He's, he's the one who gives the life to the proclamation. And he will prompt that within us. The Holy Spirit backs the preaching of the gospel with demonstrations of power. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, St. Paul assures the Thessalonians, reminds them, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. Without the Holy Spirit, they're just words. But the Holy Spirit gives them convicting and convincing power such that they can penetrate right to the core of our beings, right to our hearts. The Holy Spirit brings the word to life. He brings the power and authority of heaven to stand behind the message. He backs up the preaching of the gospel. We're going to talk a good deal more about that beginning, uh, I think, tomorrow and then the, the day after. 
but power evangelism. The Holy Spirit causes the word of salvation to be accepted and understood. He's at work in the hearts and in the minds of those that we're speaking to. The Holy Spirit predisposes the soul of the hearer to be open and receptive to the good news and the kingdom that is being proclaimed. God sheds his light into the darkness of the human heart, a darkness that has blinded that heart to the truth about God and his plan for their lives. That's Peter Herbeck speaking there. He's the mission director for Renewal Ministries. So even before we open our mouths, the Holy Spirit's at work. Even before we step outside the door, the Holy Spirit is already at work in the hearts of those to whom he will send us. Takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it? He's the one who's doing it. He inspires us. He's preparing the hearts. It's his work from beginning to end. And the more docile we are to him, as we're going to see as we go, the more effective we will be. Discipleship. It is the Holy Spirit who transforms us so that we begin to live an entirely new kind of life. If we're going to be disciples, it's the Holy Spirit who enables it to happen. We must respond. But he's the one who's at work. St. Cyril of Alexandria is the one who, who said that quote that I just gave. The Spirit gives us the power to change. An awareness and a distaste for sin and a yearning for the things of God. It is only the Holy Spirit that can do that in us. The Holy Spirit enlightens, enlightens our minds and hearts with the truth of the gospel. There's a beautiful analogy that you've got written in your, your sheets there from St. Hilary a great father of the church. He says, Our eyes cannot fulfill their task without light. Our ears cannot react without sound vibrations. They demand objects of experience in order to function. It is the same with the human soul. Unless it absorbs the gift of the Holy Spirit through faith, the mind has the ability to know God, but lacks the light necessary for that knowledge. The Holy Spirit is the one who, when received, makes it possible for a life-giving encounter with God. He's the one who makes it, makes it possible for us to receive the truth of the gospel. Amen? Amen? Still with me? Is that lunch sitting in there okay, or is it... Uh, all right. Community. The Holy Spirit gives new life to all who believe through the church. We will return to this again, but it's through the church. He gives new life to all who believe. He gives new life to us at the beginning of our entrance into the church in the sacraments of initiation. By virtue of our baptism, the first sacrament of faith, the Holy Spirit in the church communicates to us intimately and personally the life that originates in the Father and is offered to us in the Son. Through baptism in the church already, the Holy Spirit is infusing that life within us. Through our fellowship, the Holy Spirit is the source of our communion in charity in the church. From the Catechism 953. If we have communion in charity in the church, it is a work and a fruit of the Holy Spirit's action because we couldn't have it without Him. We have a, um, I don't know, I guess a slogan or a saying that we sort of live by in our community of the Companions of the Cross. That is, the effectiveness of our ministry must flow from the quality of our life together. The Holy Spirit creates community, and that, from that community, the effectiveness of our mission can flow. We need to be docile to His action in giving us community so that we may be effective in our mission. Amen? Amen. Number 688 in the Catechism, uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit in the church. The church, a communion living in the faith of the apostles, which he transmits, is a place where we know the Holy Spirit. Where do we know the Holy Spirit? In the heart of the church. What are some of the ways that we know the Holy Spirit in the church? Through the scriptures, which are God-breathed, which are inspired. He is the principal author of the Holy Spirit. Through the tradition of the church, taking what was implicit, the paradosis, the tradition of the apostles. Paul said, accept what I have said, receive what I have said, either by word of mouth or written. That we experience the Holy Spirit's action in the tradition of the church. 
the magisterium of the church, the sacramental liturgy, the Holy Spirit acting in the liturgy, in prayer, in the charisms, in all the ministries of the church, in the signs of apostolic and missionary life, in the witness of the saints. In other words, the whole life of the church is permeated by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And finally, mission. It is the Holy Spirit who prepares men and goes out to them with His grace to draw them to Christ. This ties into what we've already said in proclamation. It says the same thing in another way. He is the one who's going out and drawing souls. You know, the Holy Spirit is on mission long before we ever step out the door. We're cooperating in His mission. The Holy Spirit impels each individual to proclaim the gospel. Even the desire to evangelize is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And he helps us discern strategies for evangelization in our present world. Through the Holy Spirit, the gospel penetrates to the heart of the world, for it is he who causes people to discern the signs of the times, signs willed by God, which evangelization reveals and puts to use within history. This is a point we will return to. So all of that to say that throughout the cycle of evangelization, the Holy Spirit is active. It's His work. He's the principal agent. We see He who is the love of the Father and the Son acting, charity at the root of everything that we saw in the cycle of evangelization. He is the advocate, the one who stands beside us, defends and impels. He is the one who is revealing Christ. He is the one who is revealing Christ, and He is the life giver in all of those ways. So how are we empowered? How are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? Well, we need to realize that it begins with the sacraments of initiation. In baptism, we were called to share in Christ's prophetic office, to announce the gospel in God's kingdom. We received the virtues uh, and the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Isaiah gifts. They were infused into us. We received them in baptism. In confirmation, we were sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit in order to spread and defend the faith. And in the Eucharist, we're strengthened in grace by the Holy Spirit and sent forth on mission into the world. So already, we've received in the sacraments of initiation what we need, empowerment by the Holy Spirit. In the sacraments of initiation, we are called to evangelize. We are qualified to evangelize by the very fact that we are baptized and confirmed. We're qualified to evangelize and we are sent to evangelize. All flowing from the sacraments of initiation. Now, that's nice theory, isn't it? That's really nice theory. But are we experiencing right now this reality? Everybody who's baptized is sort of out there impelled with mission? Is that what we're experiencing? Not at all. So, what's the problem? What's, what's missing? What's the missing ingredient here? Perhaps what we're missing is an awakening to the Holy Spirit. He's the principal agent of evangelization. We need an awakening to His presence and activity. Awakening in the Holy Spirit, sometimes also referred to as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the effusion of the Holy Spirit. See, the question is, um, as Cardinal Sunans put it, you have the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have you? You have the Holy Spirit, but does He have you? We have to move from a faith of conviction, or a, 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 a faith of conviction and a faith of experience. There needs to be this faith of experience. You can receive a gift, right? At Christmas, you receive a beautiful gift from someone. It's all wrapped up with nice bows, and you put it under the tree, and you've received it. Is it yours? Yes. Does it belong to you? Yes. Is it any use to you wrapped up nicely under the tree? It has to be opened. It has to be received at that deeper place, that deeper level. 
This is really what this awakening in the Holy Spirit is. We've received the gift. We're unpacking it. We're allowing it to come to its full fruition. We're allowing the Holy Spirit awakening to his presence so that he can do what he is meant to do in our life. Another little analogy. It's one thing to see a fast car and admire its qualities. You know, its sleek exterior, its 400 horsepower under the hood. You know, it's, it's amazing sound, all these. It's another thing to get in the car and have your life blown away with your hair going back. And, you know, <laughs> it's a whole different reality, isn't it? You can admire the car from a distance, but you've got to get in the car to really experience its power, right? This is really what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about. John Paul II defines it as a cause of ever more profound experience of the presence of Christ. The effusion of the Spirit makes present and reactivates our baptism. There's the key term, right? The effusion of the Spirit makes present and reactivates our baptism, unleashing the Holy Spirit. It is a call to permanent conversion, as on the day of Pentecost's uh, Pentecostal descent of the Spirit in Jerusalem. It is a new awareness of the Lordship of Jesus in our life, that Jesus who is Lord, and only through the Spirit can He be loved, adored, proclaimed, witnessed, and shared. I'm going to invite uh, Andy up here just for one minute to uh, share a little bit about his experience with, with this reality. Okay, how to say this. The experience of the Holy Spirit. I'm a nominal, like, not now. Well, I, I might be a nominal Catholic now, but hopefully not. I'm a cradle Catholic, so I was baptized. I had my first confession, first communion. I went to Catholic schools. Um, but as a family, the family that I came from, we didn't really practice our faith. I remember going to church at with the school and with my family, but I don't remember much more than that. I certainly don't remember praying. So what happens to a person without God? St. Paul. The life of the flesh is death. The life of the spirit is joy and peace. So when I got into high school, um, I got into the cool crowd. What does the cool crowd do? Or what did the cool crowd that I got into do? They drank. They did dope. They partied. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, that's what we do. Three and a half years, like, here's my life. Three and a half years. I was an A student and, uh, you know, pretty promising. Three and a half years, woo, <laughs> plane crash. Totally wiped out, okay? I'd become a drug dealer. Uh, the guys in my class call me the bad apple, like the, the one that had the risque bad life. <laughs> uh, anyway, so... I crash, I'm laying on the ground, basically wiped out, I was, I'm estranged from my family, uh, everything's gone wrong, and something turns around. I decide, okay, well maybe, maybe it wouldn't be good if I drank and drugged myself and just made everything crazy. So a process of change started to happen, and that's when my spiritual search started, okay? Now that should be striking because I was a Catholic, but... I was nowhere near the church. It didn't occur to me that I could just go to church. I mean, maybe that's where I could get what I needed. I thought, I have to go on this search. I have to read New Age books. I have to do all this stuff because I was lost. And um, a woman that I met, uh, that I worked with, um, I was trying to evangelize her, if you know what I mean. And she actually started trying to evangelize me. And bef she left and she went away and took a job somewhere. But before she did, she dared the youth minister at my parish to invite me to a youth conference at Steubenville. I didn't know any of this. So you talk about this power evangelism. I'm at home one day in a kind of a despondent uh, mood, sitting by the phone. The phone rings. It's this woman, elderly woman from my parish, which I haven't been to in years, who's inviting me to a Catholic youth conference. And I'm looking, I'm like, who gave you this number? Like, <laughs> like there's no way I'm going near the church. Uh, that's what's going on in my mind, right? And she's describing it, and I'm like, no, that doesn't interest me, that doesn't interest me, that sounds really stupid. Uh, and, uh, 
But in my mind, okay, here's my sneaky, here's the reasoning that the Holy Spirit presented to me that tricked me. I said, you know what? You should go just to prove to those people that they're idiots, you know? <laughs> so I hear myself say, sure, I'll go. Yeah, when do, I, when do I come? So I show up with my knapsack. I'm going to Steubenville, right? For you, those of you who know what Steubenville is, I had no idea. So I get there. I'm on the bus, six-hour bus ride, and I'm trying to evangelize people. I'm like, yeah, you know, the Celestine Prophecy, that's a great book, and you should get into this energy stuff. And, and I'm sitting with some really powerful Christians. I didn't know what that meant. So, like, I'm trying to talk to this one woman that I thought was cute, and, and all of a sudden she starts, like, totally refuting my arguments. And I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> so I change seats. <laughs> next, next thing you know... There's this guy who I just thought was crazy. He, he leans over the seat and he starts basically giving me the kerygma. But the thing that surprised me was I started to go, hey, that sounds kind of good. Like my heart started to flutter a little bit and I just dismissed it. I thought, okay, don't succumb to this. So I get there at Steubenville and the first night is the big hallelujah fest, right? You know, a couple thousand kids, praise Jesus this, praise Jesus that. Just to give you an idea of where I was at, that made me angry. I can remember going to the chaplain after the big session and saying, look, 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 I have no problem with the notion of God, but all this Jesus stuff is really over the top. Like, could you just, like, what's this all about? Like, the name of Christ was irritating me, basically. So they were very, you know, they were pros. So they said, oh, just wait, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, just stick with it. I wanted to hitchhike home at that point. <laughs> so the next night I'm hearing all these stories. One of the friars of the renewal that Father Scott lived with, Father Stan, comes out. And I started to listen to him because he looked like one of the members of the Grateful Dead. And I was a big <laughs> Grateful Dead fan. I had gone to California to see the Grateful Dead, buy a lot of dope. So he comes out, I'm like, whoa. This is a little bit weird. And he starts preaching the flat out gospel. I'm like, okay, I got to listen to this guy. So big event comes. They have the holy hour. They have a holy hour with the prayer time. And I'm in there and people all there are going, wait till Saturday night. Just wait and see what happens. And I'm thinking, what are they talking about? So exposition of the blessed sacrament. I have no idea what that's about. I'm looking at the monsters. So I'm like, hmm, don't know what that is. Father Stan is standing on the stage and I see him kind of lean back and he starts praying in the spirit. And I, I saw that and I went, what is that? Because I respected him. I thought, well, he's a cool guy, so he's probably not making that up. And it looked really kind of serious. And then I started to get nervous. I thought, well, what if God is actually here? Like, and uh, there's, okay, there's a couple thousand people there. And all the people in my group are like, okay, when Father Stan comes by with the monstrance, touch the veil. They're saying this, you know, the woman with the hemorrhage, she touched Jesus' cloak, the power flows out. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. I'm literally sitting on my seat, holding it underneath with both hands, saying, I am not going to succumb to this psychological hysteria. Like, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I was thinking. I just thought, you people are all weak-minded dimwits that have fallen for this. And, but meanwhile, like, guy, people are getting picked off left and right. People are falling over. They're crying. They're seeing visions. They're having all these experiences. I'm like, this is crazy. So here it comes. Father Stan's coming by. No. Woman in front of me who, again, one of these ap apostolic middle-aged women, uh, she, she looks at me and she says, Andy, this is in the middle of the insanity, right? Things are really breaking loose in the tent. And she says, Andy. I want to pray for you because God is preparing you for something important. So the Holy Spirit, again, tricked me because I thought, of course he is. I'm an important guy, you know, <laughs> just right into the ego there. And uh, I didn't know what she had in mind. So here it comes. Very simple prayer. I don't remember what she prayed. All I remember is like these charismatic people, they're into touching, eh? Like, let's hold hands, let's... So she wants to hold my hands. I'm like, okay. And uh, she's, she's a little life raft in the middle of this craziness. She's helping my ego. All I remember, she takes my hands, and my head goes down like this, and two fire hydrants 
start pouring out of my eyes. I wasn't feeling anything at the time, but I'm like, oh my gosh, why is there water spraying out of my face? And I was really, I mean, so Jesus says, I'm, I'm serious. So Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convince the world concerning sin. And I went there, still living a pretty sinful life. And I went there saying, everything's great, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, getting a little nervous at some of the moral teachings I was hearing. I said, well, they don't apply to me because I'm enlightened. And <laughs> wham! God showed me, like, I didn't even know. Firstly, I didn't even know that God could actually touch a person. Next thing, he's inside me, touching me. And I'm seeing myself and I'm like, yeah, I should go to hell right now. Uh, whereas before that, I thought I'm a pretty good guy. You know, you hear that a lot. I'm a good person. That's what I thought I was. So I'm sitting there saying, okay, I'm hanging over the edge of hell now. And, but at the same time, there's this love pouring into me. And I'm thinking, whoa, I've never felt that before. I've looked for it. Every, under every box of beer, I looked for it. Where is it? Give me that love. And here it is, pouring into my heart. All of my, you know, my arms and legs are tingling. I didn't even know what was happening. And uh, meanwhile, the rest of the people that came with me literally jumped on top of me and started praying over me. It's like, good God got him. We got to get him. <laughs> and, and, and uh, okay, so after that, it, it, here's how the logic changed. After that, I thought, well, I have to go to confession now. That was years ago, and it never occurred to me to go to confession. Next thing, I'm like, yeah, well, I just got to go and go repent. Here I am, crying my eyes out in front of the priest. And uh, God really did something. So that at the end of that weekend, I could say, God is real. God touched me with power, and no one can dispute it. Because I tried to dispute it as it was happening. But it was so strong and so remarkable that, well, here I am now, eh? Like, from where I was to now I'm here. So there you go. Right on. Powerful example of what happens when the Holy Spirit is unleashed, right? When it moves from being just a faith of conviction to a faith of experience. When we let the Holy Spirit reveal who Jesus is at a deeper level. This effusion, this baptism of the Holy Spirit unpacking the gift that we've already received, letting it come out and letting the Holy Spirit do what he does best, which is reveal Jesus and the fullness of God's love. There's many ways that this can happen. This awakening needs to happen. There's many ways that it can happen. Many people have experienced it through the Life in the Spirit seminar, some through Marian consecration. One of our priests in our community made his final consecration to Jesus through Mary in the St. Louis de Montfort and experienced this awakening, this baptism in the Holy Spirit. Through that, Curcio weekends, Eucharistic adoration, uh, conferences, prayer meetings, people in their own private prayer. There's many ways, but this is something that needs to happen. It's something that we need to ask for. What are the effects of this, this unleashing, this effusion of the Holy Spirit, this baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, Father Francis Martin, a, a very powerful theologian, a wonderful priest, been involved almost from the beginning. He says, the first thing is there is a new awareness of the reality and the presence of Jesus Christ in one's life. It moves from being a dead letter to a living reality. Something that I know, I know, not from a textbook, something that I have experienced. I know who Jesus is. Secondly, it is a pres the presence of spiritual gifts once again in the lives of Christians. The Lord brings gifts, and we're going to get into this in a great deal more detail as we go on empowerment. I'll leave it for now, but he brings his gifts. And finally, there is a power for sanctification. The Holy Spirit's action eliminating sin and bringing a person's life in order. It gives us the power of what we could not do before. He sets us free and allows us to respond to all that God wants to do in our lives. Uh, Sherry Ann Waddell uh, writes in her book, um, Discerning Charisms. She says, whether the experience is sudden and dramatic or cumulative and quiet, 
the result is the same. You begin to seek God, to live as a disciple of Christ, to open yourself to being used by the Holy Spirit. This is the soil that allows the seeds of the charisms to come into full bloom. Now, this is not a fringe thing that we're talking about. This is something which permeates the life, the history, the spirituality of the church from the very beginning, from the very beginning. It, um, I just want to quote from the Holy Father, John Paul II, and this is uh, an audience that he gave this Pentecost, this year, just passed. Thanks to the charismatic movement, many Christians have rediscovered Pentecost as a living and present reality in their daily life. I desire that the spirituality of Pentecost be spread in the church as a renewed thrust of prayer, holiness, communion, and proclamation. See how what he's saying, the fruits of this are, and how it, reunites to, or how it relates to everything that we've talked about? Seeking the Holy Spirit. There is a scriptural model for being empowered in the Holy Spirit, and I want to cover this uh, quickly as I can, but it's an important point, so I want to take enough time to make sure you get it. If we look at our Lord's baptism in the Jordan, after all the people had been baptized and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And then later, Jesus began his ministry. We see three very distinct stages. It's a biblical model of how we are empowered in the Holy Spirit. And the first step is going to prayer. Going to prayer. Prayer, the soul of the apostolate, going to prayer. Wait for the promise of the Father about which you heard me speak, Jesus says. And all these devoted themselves with one accord to pray, to prayer. Paul VI, Pope Paul VI brings this, makes it concrete. We exhort all evangelizers, whoever they may be, to pray without ceasing to the Holy Spirit with faith and fervor and to let themselves prudently be guided by him as the decisive inspirer of their plans, their, initi their initiatives, and their evangelizing activity. He needs to be the source. If he's the principal agent of evangelization and we aren't receiving his direction in prayer, his inspiration and his guidance, guess what we're doing? We're doing maybe good things, but we're not doing God's thing. Right? So he needs to be there. Going to prayer is the first step. The second step, then we receive the Holy Spirit. Techniques of evangelization are good, says Pope Paul VI. But even the most advanced ones could not replace the gentle action of the Spirit. The most perfect preparation of the evangelizer has no effect without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the most convincing dialectic has no power over the heart of man. We need to receive the Holy Spirit. He needs to come to us. This isn't a one-time event. All through the, the book of Acts, if you want a nice little Bible study on this, every time the, whole, the apostles are in trouble, every time the church is in trouble, Lord, stretch out your hand. The experience of Pentecost was an ongoing reality. We go to prayer, then we receive the Spirit, and then finally the Spirit works through us in power. In various ways. One of them is the most dramatic, signs and wonders. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. The word for power there is dunamis. It's the root word for dynamite. It's power. It's power. God backs the proclamation of the gospel with power, real power. Confidence. God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power, Love and self-control in 2 Timothy. He gives us the confidence to do this. I'm afraid of evangelizing? Go to prayer. We'll receive the Holy Spirit. He'll give us the confidence. He'll give us everything that we lack and everything that we need. Richie said that so beautiful in, uh, in the second talk this morning. And finally, fruitfulness. I planted, says St. Paul, Apollos watered, but who caused the growth? God caused the growth. So we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to evangelize. Otherwise, it'll end up being a work of the flesh based on human strength and ingenuity, and it will not last. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent of evangelization. We're cooperating in His work and not vice versa. It's not, I'm going to do this, God, please bless it. It's, Lord, what do you want? 
and help me to get on side. The Holy and finally, I just want to end with Mary is the perfect model of docility to the Holy Spirit. John Paul II, among us, with raised hands as praying the Virgin, Mother of Christ and of the Church, together with her, let us implore and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, light of truth, strength of authentic peace. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. You who, in the variety of human languages, gathers peoples into the, in the one faith, Alleluia, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Do we have any questions on this, uh, on this topic, Empowered to Evangelize? Please come on up to the mic. Just, uh, just step right up and we'll, uh, we'll answer a few of these. I'm wondering when you know um, it's the right time to, to evangelize someone. Like I've had different experiences where sometimes it's very obvious that mm -hmm. they are ready. And other times I'm wondering, is this just me wanting to do this? And usually when it is, it's not very successful. But I don't know how to, dis you know, to distinguish the time. Well, I think, I think that there's no written rule anywhere that would tell us. I think it's a matter of becoming sensitive to the Holy Spirit, seeing what the Father is doing and responding. But we'll probably get into that in more detail when we talk about techniques. But it's really, it's sensitivity. It's sensitivity to what questions are they asking, what's happening. Uh, and then you will know how to respond to what the real needs are. What are they really saying, even through their words? and to know that. The other thing is, I think, just experience. You know, we, we get a personal history with the Holy Spirit. You know, I've seen this before. I've, I've felt, you know, I've known this before. I've had that sense before, and I've acted on it, and here's how it came out. So I develop a sense of history with the Holy Spirit, and I'm able to learn and to grow uh, from time to time. But we will come into that in more detail. The amount of knowledge that you need. Okay, the Holy Spirit, I agree, totally empowered. Mm. Da -da -da -da. the knowledge. I mean, I always trip up on that. I just don't have that ah, knowledge. This is a wonderful you know, question. Do I have to study for 10 years? No, no, <laughs> you do not. You are already called, you are already qualified, and you are already sent. And you know what? 99% of evangelization isn't about academic disputes or you know, apologetics or whatever else. You know, we're going to talk about training to help remove obstacles. But, you know, usually the most important and powerful thing is the testimony of my own life. Here's what God did for me. You know, you listen to what Andy had to say. Wow. Wow. You can imagine a young man, a young woman, sitting somewhere listening to that when he's ordained and he's preaching and he's telling his story, going, that sounds like me. And, and look where he is now. He's happy now. And look at the witness of his life. And see, it's the simple things usually which are the most effective. So no. But we will come back to this. Father Terry is going to have a great deal more to say about it. We want to provide you with many tools to help remove obstacles for people. But the most powerful thing is just saying what God has done in your life. Yeah. Uh, what would you do or what would you suggest when you have someone that comes to your door to evangelize you? Uh, ah, now this, you see, now Father Terry's got a big grin on his face back there because he lives for that kind of occasion and opportunity, you know. It's, it's like, oh yeah, come on in, have a little seat there, can I get you anything? Uh, we will get into that in a good deal more detail, but you know, if we have conviction and I'm, I've got this living relationship with Jesus, I'm not afraid of people, you know, and I'm not afraid to share my own experience. What's happened to me? You know, most of the people I've read, uh, and I couldn't even tell you where now, maybe I heard it on EWTN, but uh, the, most of the, the Mormons who are converted out of that church or the Jehovah's Witnesses who are converted out of that church back into the church, it's usually because of the simple testimony of the people they're trying to evangelize because they, don't, they haven't experienced that or they've never felt that or there's small doubts eating away at them and, and your life, your witness just confirms everything they were afraid of and it, it starts something. You know, but I, I, I'm going to let Father Terry handle that in more detail when the time comes, because asking a question like that to Father Terry is like saying, sick him to a pit bull, you know, it's a. <laughs> Father, um, I guess my question is, so you, let's say that you've come upon a mission that you're going to go. Now, I, the problem I have is, who do I ask? <laughs> because Holy Trinity, one God. Do I ask the whole, I know I ask the Holy Spirit, but I just, like, I'm not undercutting Jesus by asking him, am I? No, 
No, you see, and the thing is that um, um, when we pray to the Spirit, we're also praying, in a sense, to the Father and to the Son. You know, uh, the, Holy, uh, the, uh, the three persons are one God, are one God. So even the Catechism will say, when we say the Our Father, we say the Our Father prayer, you know, it's also received by the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it's not something we need to worry about. In our liturgy, in the liturgical life of the church, what we do is we pray to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. But we're also encouraged to develop devotion, to speak to Jesus, my friend, the lover of my soul, my Savior, my Lord. And we can speak to the Holy Spirit, my advocate, my guide, who's leading me, who's guiding me this day. Especially if we're planning, we're doing... You know, we're looking for ways to reach out, to ask the Holy Spirit to inspire us, to, to show us. So it's, uh, you know, the funny thing is that even prayer is spirit-led. We couldn't even pray if it weren't by the Holy Spirit. So it, it, it's something that flows. Probably the best thing I could say because it, is to have a look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church in that regard and just see what it says about that. Because I know that there's more there. I just can't remember exactly what it, what it lays out.